president of the Dallas Civil Historical Society, and um, on behalf of everyone at the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, I'd like you to, uh, to be welcome to the first Harold A. Pullman Lecture of the 2001-2002 year. As you know, this is our second year in this lecture series, thanks to our benefactor. And uh, we are proud to be able to present to you um, speakers that we think, or we hope, will be of interest to everyone in the Dallas Jewish community. Um, we thank you for your support of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. If you are a member, thank you again. If you're not a member, we do have membership uh, envelopes available at the table in the back. And if you're not a member, we would love to have you join us. So, and we're, we will take checks today, so. Yes, our, our uh, membership chair, uh, Jackie Prager, will be at the desk later. And so uh, if you would like to join, uh, please do so now. We would really appreciate it. Um, we also have uh, for sale tribute and note cards with historic pictures of Dallas on them, and they're for sale also at the desk. So if you'd like to take a look at them before you leave today, please do. I'm going to turn the program over now to our program director, Ellie Naxon, who's going to give you a little bit of information about our next program. Thank you. It's really, this is a fun group to be part of, and it doesn't take a lot of effort uh, except intellectual. Uh, every year we like to have a theme, and this year our theme has been Jews or Jewish influences in the arts. So our next meeting is going to be on December 11th, which is on a Tuesday evening right here, and we're doing one of the Jewish films, and Susan Wilkowski, who did that wonderful, uh, some of you saw it on Salsa, the, the wonderful movie uh, documentary, she, she's excellent. She will be here and so will Bart White, who is a professor of film at UT. So we have two very good people and we'll have some interesting films put on uh, Jewish film. Uh, that's the main program for this, for the rest of the fall. In the spring, you'll get information on the spring uh, program. And in early December, we're also planning on uh, having a Trailblazers event, those are for the Trailblazers event is for those who uh, are generous and give more than their minimum uh, on a yearly basis. And uh, we usually try to have a very nice either lunch or a brunch or a tea or something, uh, and also something cultural. So we're planning that in early December. And uh, I would like now to introduce uh, Jimmy Alexander, who will introduce our speaker. Jimmy has been very <laughs> Jimmy has been a backbone of this group, and uh, we're real pleased to have him introduce us. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, you mentioned our benefactor, Paul McLeod. Harold is somewhere in the room in the back. Raise your hand, Harold. Uh, 
much of the interest in Texas Jewish history uh, can be attributed to his pioneer work in founding that organization. And I'm glad to say he continues to be active in this. I'm chairman, I'm chairman of many committees, comes to the annual meetings and to many board meetings. He is the author of Henry Cohen, Pioneer Texas Rabbi, uh, Songs for the Soul, uh, editor, was editor of Deep in the Hearts, uh, the, the History of Europe, Texas Jewry, was written under the auspices of the Texas Jewish Historical Society, and he's a contributing Jewish editor for the Handbook of Texas, published by the Texas State Historical Association. I'm going to up here a minute. I mean, in addition to your prepared remarks, yes, sir. would you make some comments on this handbook of Texas history, which I think these people are not necessarily familiar with. Uh -oh. And uh, I think it's available on, on the internet for buying great expenses at the library. It's my pleasure now to introduce my friend Rabbi Jim Kessler.
So I'll do to you as was done to me in rabbinical school. How many of you remember the movie uh, Robin Hood? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. How many of you, uh, as a kid, uh, thought to boo, even if you didn't boo, the tax collector uh, for the sheriff? Yeah? Good anti-Semite is all of them. Uh, we were the tax collectors, gang. We were the folks that they sent out to collect the money. And, uh, and as Mel Brooks would say, to count the money. And uh, then, once we were done with our job, we got paid, they took the taxes, and we had no place to spend it. We couldn't wear the clothes that the community wore. We couldn't live where the community lived. Now, I'm, this is a big, broad paintbrush. There are obviously ex uh, um, other explanations in other communities that differed, but a big, broad stroke would include this approach. And as a result, um, we were left with money and not a lot to do with it. And so by the time the 12th century came along and Christianity grew in Europe, people began to build churches and cathedrals and palaces. Well, when you want to do that kind of stuff, the question is, who has money? Who has wealth? Well, the Jews did. So the answer was, we'll borrow the money from the Jews. And we have records of these loans, these notes. Jews were loaned, were uh, those who provided money to build palaces and to build cathedrals. The bummer is that no palace and no cathedral, even today, makes money. They all cost money. So at some point, the notes came due. And the question was, do you really have to pay the note to the local Jew? And so the very first proclamations issued by the popes in the Middle Ages came out against the Jews somewhere towards the end of the 1200s, saying, if you're a Christian and you owe money to a Jew, the note is void. You owe them nothing. So all of a sudden, the money that was owed on the cathedrals and the churches were no longer owed. And so the Jews had a response. And the response came about the first 20 or 30 years, first three or four decades, three or four decades of uh, the 1300s, and that was mass conversions to Christianity. Why? Well, I'm no longer a Jew. I'm now a Christian. You owe me the money. And that's exactly what happened. And, and so the notes uh, were reinstated. Uh, people began to fret about paying money to the Jews who were now Christians. And that phenomenon occurred for a few decades. And then all of a sudden, somewhere in 1370, 1380, there arose the theory, particularly in Spain, of something called limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood. How long were you a Christian? And if you hadn't been a Christian long enough, then I don't owe you the money. And so, as the 1400s began, Jews were right back in the same place they were in before. Our ancestors around Europe, different countries, different times, it, it wasn't all in mass at once, but the phenomenon is repeated over and over again. And the end result to this then was that the Jewish community who had converted to Christianity began to send their oldest sons to church, and they made them priests. And so we have a wonderful list of Jewish names of Catholic bishops around Europe, most particularly in Spain, but around Europe, who were from Jewish homes, but who were part of those families that converted well, now that you have a bishop or a priest, and you can kind of finagle the records to get your money, even though this is centuries old, okay, the solution to this was, well, you have to then ferret out these outrageous Christians who aren't doing what they're supposed to do, and Pope Leo III signed the first Inquisition Bull. He established the Inquisition to go after Christians who were practicing Judaism are not practicing the faith. And once again, the Jews found themselves out in the cold. And just in case we thought we could come up with some other hanky-panky, somewhere beginning in the 1400s, Jews began to be expelled from countries.
one place or another. And a group of those Jews who were about to be expelled from Spain, though they didn't know it, ended up coming to Mexico. They came to Nueva España. They came with the conquistadors. And the way you could come to America, or what was actually Texas, gang, uh, was that the local, the conquistador paid a Jew tax to bring his local Jew with him. Now, why did you want to bring your local Jew with you? Well, the answer was simple. Your Jew knew how to count. Somebody had to keep the business records of the gold that you expected to get from this new land. And moreover, you had to produce records for the church and the nobility to look at. Now, who better than a local Jew to bring? Why? Well, think of it this way. First of all, the Jew depended on you as the conquistador for his survival. Uh, you had to be protected from the people who were going to, uh, uh, for, from whom you were going to collect the gold. And somehow or another, that made you in their debt. You couldn't go back to Spain. That was certainly not a place where you could survive. The end result was that somehow or another, you were dependent upon them. So the conquistador dies, the conquistador goes back to Spain, or the conquistador is, is uh, throttled, as it were, by his own hand. And the end result is that uh, the rise of what today we hear about in New Mexico called crypto-Jews comes into existence. Because the presumption is that the Jews who were here in Nueva España just melded into the woodwork. They married native Indians, whether they were the remnants of the Aztec or whomever, and they spun off into their own families. And so today, in uh, New Mexico particularly, uh, you will find that people are coming forward with documents, letters that were written by their ancestors, telling of the uh, fact that they once were Jews, but had converted to Christianity in order to survive. We know about those people, unfortunately, because of the Inquisition documents from Mexico. For example, there is a lady who is burned at the stake at the age of 89, for Judaizing. Well, what was Judaizing? Well, what she did is on Friday, she wore a braided collar. Also, if you happen to drink cocoa on Friday, that was also a Jewish thing. And God forbid you should sweep out your house on Friday, because that meant you were cleaning up for Shabbos. Any of those three things made you guilty of the charge of Judaizing, which was the act that uh, could cause you to be burned at the stake. This lady was burned at the stake, raises some interesting kind of questions. Why was she burned at the stake? Well, you are left, you are left hanging until you look at the um, distribution of her estate after she died. And the distribution of her estate after she died says that the first item on the list went to the government, and the first item on the list were seven sailing ships. Now, they weren't turning out liberty ships in the 15 and 1600s, gang. Ships took a year or so to build. The Spanish Gold Fleet had just been sunk by the British. Uh, British quote-unquote pirates with letters of mark who could go out and, and uh, capture wealth for, for the British Empire. So how do you get seven ships quickly? Well, you burn somebody at the stake and you take their boats. I can't tell you that's what happened. No, let me phrase it another way. I can't tell you that's why it happened, but I can tell you that's what happened. And it's very possible that those go together. So. Despite what the New Yorkers want to tell you, the earliest Jews who ever came to what is today the continental United States came to Texas. And the first record we have of those Jews who came to Texas was in 1510. And we know about them in 1510 because that was when the first one was burned. Now, obviously they didn't get to create a Jewish community here. Uh, the Jewish community was created in 1654. 
in New Amsterdam, the first Jewish community in, in what became the United States. But for those of you interested in Texas Jewish history, you can kind of thump your chest a little longer, a little louder, a little prouder that uh, the first Yids that put foot on Texas, I mean on American soil, put it on Texas soil uh, when they motivated around or they traveled around the state looking for um, uh, places to settle. Now, the, the rest of Texas history you know about, you studied about. Um, the point that I wanted to make for you in doing that background before moving to the Galveston plan was to point out to you that in one way or another for the past, give or take, actually 1900 years, but certainly for the last thousand or 1200 years, uh, we Jews have lived in a, um, as a minority in a community where we have tried to find a way to survive. And in this part of the world, it had to do with sometimes uh, letting our Judaism be subsumed under whatever our identity was. Let me also point out to you, it wasn't unique amongst the Jews. There's some wonderful records in Texas history about, for instance, Methodist ministers who went out and bought Catholic collars and pretended to be Catholic priests when Mexico said that the only ministers that could be in this world, this part of the world, uh, were Catholic priests. And then once the Texas Revolution was over, they took off those collars and they opened Methodist churches in Catholic churches that they had been running. Just to talk about the concept of surviving. Well, now let me take you to the Galveston plan a little bit. Um, and then I want to be sure to leave time for you all to uh, have uh, questions. And, uh, and if I didn't cover something you're interested in, I'll try and talk about it. But there's so many members of the society here who know so much more than I do that I uh, can point to you and, and let them answer for me. Uh, you know as well as I that as the 1800s came to an end, uh, the uh, life uh, of Jews in Europe got worse. Uh, pogroms increased. Uh, the, the turmoil that was operative in the political life of Europe uh, had its effect upon the survival of Jews. And we were pawns who moved back and forth from one area to another. If you try and trace a little town, for instance, uh, one colleague who writes in this field has pointed out to me that one town he knows of changed hands some 30 times. Uh, and, and that included two countries plus a couple of countries that don't even exist anymore. I mean, it just, it, it, it just was kind of a hodgepodge of things. And Jews were looking to come to this country. You know that the most theories suggest that the first major Jewish immigration to the United States was Sephardic. Uh, that began with uh, the 1700s, as it were, and moved on up until uh, about 1880. And then the next large movement was Germanic and it went from about 1850 up through the beginning of the 1900s, and then somewhere towards the 1890s uh, began the major Eastern European migration of Jews to the United States that constituted the millions that, that came through uh, Ellis Island. I want to suggest to you a couple of theories about why the Galveston Plan was instituted. Uh, I will leave it to you to decide which ones uh, you care to buy into or not. I'll try and tell you the sources of them and, and you can see which ones you're comfortable with. The Jews who came through Ellis Island knew in Europe, at least as best we understand, that New York was the street, the city with the streets paved with gold. So you wanted to come to New York. That was the place. There were Yiddish newspapers published in New York. The foreword is still printed today. Uh, there was the Yiddish theater in New York. Uh, the language was available to you even if you didn't speak English, which is kind of interesting the way it's spelled at times. The German Jews who really didn't care too much for the Eastern European Jews because they were afraid that the Christians in the community wouldn't like them. Uh, that is, they wouldn't like the German Jews anymore when they found out what their Eastern European cousins looked like, i.e. they wore these black long coats they wore these strange felt hats, and worse than that, they ate onion sandwiches and never took baths. We Jews turned out to be the first people to open up settlement houses in America. It was not the Red Cross, it was not the Salvation Army gang, it was us. 
But we did it for a little bit different reasons. We did it because we figured if we could bring in these faucets, put them in regular clothes and teach it being something that under in sandwiches, then our Christian neighbors wouldn't think badly of us. Unfortunately, we know that to be true because they actually put ads in newspapers to that effect. Come, we'll teach you English, we'll change your clothes, we'll get rid of the yarmulke, we'll get rid of the tzitzis, and we'll teach you to eat regular food. And, and come and we'll make you rich, you'll join the American world. So, one way or another, if I don't talk this over, um, the East Coast drew folk in. There were people concerned that the East Coast could then be an incredible source of anti-Semitism, in the sense that all these Jews were coming, they were different, they had to be assimilated, we had to do something for them. And so, the richest Jew in America, in the turn of the century, in the previous century, pardon me, uh, was Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff was a reformed German Jew by origin who uh, was a very large giver to charity, but by the same token he had some fears about this. And so the solution was to somehow or another bring the Jews somewhere else, settle them somewhere else. Well, California certainly was a possibility, but that was a long schlep because the Suez Canal wasn't exactly there. And, oh, not Suez, I'm sorry, the uh, Panama Canal wasn't exactly there. People had to make a long trek, and so that wasn't a particular option. I hope I'm not about to insult anybody from New Orleans, but I have to tell you that the Jews in New Orleans didn't want any more immigrants. Uh, some of the articles that were written in, uh, uh, by Jewish writers there simply pointed out that uh, this was an old Jewish community and we don't need any newcomers. We've got plenty here already. Whoa. <laughs> Out of Dr. Kaufman's knowledge. Uh, Galveston turned out to be an interesting place for a couple of reasons. First of all, there was a direct steamship line, uh, I'm sorry, there was a direct ship via steamship line from Bremen, Germany. Now, if you come to Galveston today and look in the old Jewish and Christian cemetery, you're going to see some incredible masonry work. And it turns out that it was safer and cheaper, interestingly enough, to have a stone carved in Europe and brought to Galveston by ship than it was to have it carved in the United States and put on a wagon because the wagon bounced against the hard ground. And even though the ship rocked and rolled, it didn't hurt it as much. And there apparently weren't as talented stone cutters in Texas during the time these stones were, uh, were carved. So the steamship line was an important piece of bringing people in. Another important piece of bringing people to Galveston was Henry Cohen. Henry Cohen was uh, the rabbi of Temple B'nai Israel from 1888 to 1952. He almost had the longest tenure of any rabbi in America. But Rabbi Magnin out in California outlasted him by two years. Rabbi Magnin also outlived three associates, but that's another story. And, uh, uh, but Dr. Cohen was uh, in Galveston during an incredible period in, a, in world Jewish history, when you think about it. Rabbi Magnin was a modern graduate of the Hebrew Union College in the 1930s, and, and it was the period of World War II that he saw. But think about what Cohen saw as an adult coming to Galveston, which was the largest and most important city in Texas in 1888. It was so important that the British government had a consulate in, in the city. Uh, Cohen was a part of a, he was British, Cohen was a part of a whipped group, as uh, I've uh, found advertised in the newspapers. They would sit around and talk about the news in England uh, with the British accents uh, still uh, flaring wild and, and loud. Dr. Cohen had seen an incredible amount of history, and when the island was destroyed in 1900 uh, by the hurricane, uh, Henry Cohen was one of the three Jews on the seven-person committee uh, to rebuild the island. It's very interesting that three of the seven people were members of Temple B'nai Israel, Jewish obviously, and Dr. Cohen was the only minister or minister or clergy of any sort that was on that committee stay to rebuild the island, and so was clearly a voice to be heard 
Uh, with all due respect to um, the rabbis who followed him in Texas, uh, most academicians of uh, Texas history who aren't Jewish will point to Cohen as being the preeminent rabbi of the 1900s. It doesn't say anything less about Rabbi Olin, for example, here, or Schachtel or Khan in Houston, or, or uh, Rabbi Shur in Fort Worth, or uh, uh, David Jacobson, or, or his son-in-law in, in, uh, in San Antonio. But because of the years that Cohen was in the saddle and did the things that he did, we have a prison board in this state because of Dr. Cohen. Uh, he and his Senator Shepard rallied that cause. At any rate, Cohen was a personage. And the other interesting thing was that the, the Englishman, the European contact person that Jacob Schiff had been in touch with uh, was a, uh, a schoolmate of Henry Cohen. And uh, the end result was that this allowed for some contact in terms of bringing the people here. So the theory was that you brought the people to Texas and they through Galveston and they would be spread out throughout the rest of the United States. I, I offer to your attention Cynthia and Alan Mondell's uh, excellent uh, video uh, on uh, west of Hester Street that, that tells the story of the Galveston plan. And I want to come back to it in a minute and tell you why it is a docudrama instead of a documentary. But that kind of gets to the end of the story of the plan, not the beginning. The, the plan also may have had another reason entirely, and that has to do with Zionism. And I can't tell you that this is true, but it is a theory that is espoused, for example, by a man named Marenbach who is a uh, graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary, the conservative rabbinical school, who wrote as his doctorate at, after ordination uh, uh, the uh, Galveston plan, Galveston, the Ellis Island of the West, in which he suggests this may have been a reason that had nothing to do with overcrowding. That had to do with the fact that Jacob Schiff was frightened that the Jews in Europe were going to be destroyed. He had lived through and witnessed the Dreyfus events, therefore thinking that something had to be done. And when quote unquote Palestine was a not an acceptable option and Uganda was offered, for those of you who remember that piece of uh, Jewish history, he thought that the Jews should have taken it because at least it was a land to go to and one could get the Jews out of Europe and it would save their lives. Obviously, as you know, uh, the Basel Conference, or one of them in Europe during the late 1800s, early 1900s, several times the Zionist movement rejected uh, that offer from the British government and, and stuck with the idea of Israel, today's Israel, Palestine at the time. The thought was that if you brought all these Eastern European Jews to New York, you would fuel the desire to return to Israel. But if you kept them away from New York, then maybe, somehow, he could influence folk to support the Uganda offer. Because the tradition, the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern European folk tradition, was we have to return to Eretz Yisrael, not Uganda, or whatever they were going to make up a name for it. Uh, clearly there was a place, a specific place that was an option, not Africa. So if you have millions of Eastern European Jews coming with that piece of tradition being a central part of their prayers, of their kishkis, if you will, Let's move them to where they're not going to add to the people who are already pushing them. Let's put them in Kansas City. Let's put them in Oklahoma. Let's put them here or there. And nobody's going to hear them. Now, I can't tell you if that's true or not. Um, there aren't any documents in Schiff's papers that support that. Uh, Marenbach, in his book, which is still available in print, alludes to some of those ideas. Unfortunately, and this sort of leads me to a more modern view of what happened with the plan, 
For those people who came over on the plan, it was a wonderful success. In terms of Jacob Schiff, the plan was a failure. Uh, he hoped to bring millions of people. The best guess is 10 to 12,000 people came through the Galveston plan over its seven years. Now, why is it the best guess? Because we don't have any records. It is presumed that our government did away with the records so that there would be no trail to the anti-Semitism that was being espoused by the various people who occupied the positions of authority at the Galveston Port of Entry. We know from Henry Cohen's records, for example, of a man who was to have been sent back because he was a Jew with an eye condition. You know, it was you looked in the eye and it looked red, that was an excuse for shipping you back. Dr. Cohen borrowed $100 or whatever it was from, I don't think he borrowed, he got $100 from H. Kempner, uh, I. H. Kempner, I'm sorry, and, and took a train to Washington. Uh, as you know, the story goes that he ended up in the president's office ultimately after being turned down by the Labor Department secretary who was then in charge of immigration. The president said that he didn't get involved with local issues like that, that they had local immigration officers to handle it. And as Cohen was leaving his office, the president said he was impressed that, that uh, Dr. Cohen came to uh, uh, save one of his congregants. And Cohen turned around and said, this man's not Jewish, he's Russian Orthodox. And the president was so impressed that he sent a telegram to the head of the uh, uh, immigration office in Galveston to hold that man and turn him over to Cohen. So there are some hit and miss thoughts in various letters that I've seen that allude to the fact that as the 1907 date began to pass and it got closer to the 1914 date, the whole idea of keeping foreigners out not only was prevalent around the country, that we know in general in American history, but that particularly Galveston had people who wanted to keep the Jews out. And finally, by 1914, the plan came to a crash and halt. Unfortunately, now, there are no records. When you write the Immigration and Naturalization Service today and ask about those records, they have a great buzzword. It's called their unretrievable. Did you ever see the movie um, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, I used to think that maybe they were in a big box somewhere, rolled into the back of one of these humongous anonymous warehouses, and if I could only find the warehouse, I'd go on a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt with a hammer and, and, and try and pry open the box and look at the records. I'm more and more convinced now that the records were destroyed, because uh, nobody seems to know where they are. And, and the deputy director of the INS was in Galveston for the 100th anniversary of the Immigration uh, Naturalization Service, um, sat next to the president of our congregation who inquired about those records through the entire lunch. And all the lady could say was, gee, you know, I've never seen them. I don't know anything about them. I've looked at all our records before I came down here, and we have no records of the Galveston plan. And as I've mentioned to you, Jacob Schiff's papers have no records of the Galveston plan. Dr. Cohen's papers that are at the Barker, Texas History Center in Austin uh, have no uh, letters or correspondence that deal with the Galveston plan. But for those people who came through it, it worked. Uh, I once opened my big mouth in, uh, here in Dallas, Texas, at what, when it existed at a District 7 B'nai B'rith uh, convention. And I said, can you imagine you're living in Europe somewhere and somebody said to you, come to Galveston, Texas. Now, I said, nobody would want to do that. And a lovely human being who's a dear friend, Morris Polsky, a dermatologist in Austin, raised his hand and he said, my daddy did. <laughs> so I kind of quit saying it, except to tell you from a lighthearted story, that the a perspective that the people who came through the plan got out of Europe. I will tell you that they didn't move quite as far into the United States, generally speaking, as they hoped they would in the plan. If you take a, a protractor or a compass and you draw an arc with Galveston as the, uh, the point, you'll find all kinds of little towns in Texas where there's shoals. Some of them are just buildings now. 
But this is where people got off the boat, came away, and thought, are you kidding me? This is what it's like when you leave Houston and Galveston and scrub brush. There's nothing. And this is what I've heard from, from their children. They would say, they stopped. It was like, I'm not going any further. It can only be worse. So, uh, you know, our ancestors, I have an incredible respect for. It is absolutely mind-boggling to me that they were willing to leave civilized part of the world, even though uh, it was not a very safe civilized part of the world, and get on a boat that didn't have stabilizers and didn't serve midnight brunches and, uh, and, and travel across the Atlantic uh, to some place here where, generally speaking, they didn't speak the language. I mean, one of the best stories I know, it really has nothing to do with Texas Jewish history per se, was one of my um, uh, fraternity brothers in college, who's still a very dear friend. His father got on a boat uh, from Europe in uh, 1929 as a teenager. The boat stopped first in Tampico, Mexico, and he didn't speak anything but Polish and Yiddish. He thought he was an American, got off the boat <laughs> and stayed. And the only thing he could do, though he knew how to be a, a, a cobbler, was he became a cattle, uh, a cowboy for a cattle ranch, because Tampico is a large cattle raising area of Mexico. He became a multi-millionaire, had three ranches by the time I met Abe, and now Abe runs his ranches. His father since passed away, but his father told me, he said, you know, it was, what did I know? I was a teenager. I came on a boat. Somebody said, it's America. I got off. <laughs> But, but, but as I told, told Marcus, I really admired the fact that he was willing to do that. How much the more so if you're somewhere in Europe and someone hands you a flyer and it says in Yiddish, come to Texas, to uh, what, like either Tav or, or, or Tet, Kuf Sama Sama. I mean, you never saw a word like this in Talmud, you never saw it in Torah, Texas, some kind of place. And, 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 but people did come, and, and as I say, the Galveston plan was an effort to try and settle them in such a way that anti-Semitism would not be quite as uh, prevalent. It fulfills, by the way, a wonderful midrash, and I want to kind of bring this to a close because I've hocked you for almost an hour, and I wanted to give you a chance to ask questions. There's a, a lovely midrash that was written when the temple was destroyed in 70, and the um, uh, the story is told that a, 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 Roman, a Roman soldier asks the rabbi, if your God is so great, how come he let us destroy the temple and scatter you? Uh, the rabbi said to him, uh, you know, your question is so inconsequential, my student can answer it, which is the first put-down part. And the rest of it goes on to simply say that if you have a treasure and it's in one place, it can be destroyed. But if you put it in a lot of different places, even if you destroy it in one place, it'll remain in other places. So in a sense, what the Galveston plan looked to do, though it didn't necessarily accomplish it, was to kind of spread us out into different places so that um, if, God forbid, the uh, Jewish community of New York had disappeared, then the potential was for us to be in a lot of other places. Um, my hope is that maybe one day somebody will find that box somewhere. The Texas Jewish Historical Society tried a few years back to uh, secure the names of everyone's relative that they knew of that came through Galveston. Uh, and, and a list was compiled that's now in the Barker Texas History Center. Uh, the society, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Texas Seaport Museum in Galveston has a somewhat complete, but not totally complete, list of all the people who came through the port from about 1840 on. Uh, it is now available on the internet. You can access the Texas Seaport Museum site, and you follow the directions, and you can pull up all those names at home without coming to Galveston, but you should come to Galveston anyway. And no, I don't know the website. Uh, but if you just like under Texas Seaport Museum, it's the only one named such uh, in the state uh, uh, to get their website. Um, let me make just a couple of general comments and then I will hush. Uh, Jimmy suggested that I should mention to you the existence of the Handbook of Texas. 
Uh, the original handbook was put together back in the 1930s. Uh, it was uh, Walter Prescott Webb, who was a great Texas historian. Uh, when it came out, and its third volume came out in the 1950s, uh, I think there were probably 22 Jewish listings, something like that, that, that was found. And so the Texas Jewish Historical Society decided early on that we needed to, if nothing else, if it, if it failed and fell apart and didn't succeed, that at the very least we would get the names of all the Jews we could that lived in Texas and whatever the state required, the State Historical Association required, to get their names in that book, we would get the names in the book. And so the society came into existence, uh, I'm sorry, came into uh, the idea of sending a survey out to every community and every library in the state, uh, asking are there any Jews in your area and what can you tell us about them? And from that came the material. The, the ultimate source, supposedly, of Texana today is the Handbook of Texas. It's seven volumes, I think, if I'm right. Seven, six, seven, seven, probably. And, and I was lucky to be nominated by the Texas Jewish Historical Society to represent us on it. There are about 200 and some odd articles on Jews in the handbook. Some of you sitting in this room, like Natalie Ornish, I wrote some wonderful articles that have been included in it. Um, there, there is um, uh, a lot of information and a lot of material in it. Uh, I'll take three more minutes to tell you about the Texas Jewish Historical Society. When I went to rabbinical school, uh, Jews didn't go to rabbinical school in Texas, I was told. And there were no Jews in Texas, I was told. In my day, uh, the collection of Texas, I'm sorry, of, of Americana and Jewish life was the American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati at the Hebrew Union College. It had a larger collection even than the American Jewish Historical Society, and uh, it was walls of index cards, pre-computer days. And I pulled out the T for Texas, and there were two index cards, one on Rabbi Cohen and one on the split of Beth Israel in use. I'm sorry, the split of Beth Israel that created Temple of Man, typed in red letters. That was it. Nothing else on Texas Jews, and I was furious because I thought that, you know, being a chauvinistic Texan, there ought to be a lot more on the Texas jury. And uh, so I kvetched all through rabbinical school about Texas. Uh, Barton Lee, whose mom is here somewhere, um, I can point to and tell you that her son started this. This is not my fault. I take no credit, but I carried it on. On Texas Independence Day, Barton's two years ahead of me in rabbinical school, they would lower the flag of the United States and hoist the flag of Texas and get a keg of beer and put it out on the front lawn of the rabbinical school and the windows in the classroom building were all open because in those days it wasn't air conditioned and we would invite people to come out and we'd play the eyes of Texas on a little portable phonograph and, uh, and so when Bart was ordained, Jean Levy and I from San Antonio carried on the tradition. I don't know if anybody carried it after us. But I will tell you one cute story about it, and that is that now, across the street, up the hill, is a gazebo that was built. And that gazebo is in honor of the Ohioans who gave their life in the Texas Revolution. And so the American flag flies there, and the Ohio flag, and the Texas flag flies there over the Hebrew Union College. So uh, <laughs> have a certain degree of uh, satisfaction. At any rate, I came to Galveston in Quebec and, and uh, remember putting an article in the newspaper of the, uh, the then paper out of Fort Worth that Mr. Wishing put out and uh, the one in Houston saying that we needed to preserve Texas Jewish history somehow or another and the society came into being 20, almost 21 years ago you know, and uh, boasts about seven or 800 members and is still going strong. When I, one last comment, when Alan and Cynthia Mondale went to do their movie, by the way, I didn't mean to skip this, uh, they went looking for documents. They were hoping to do a mainstream kind of documentary, and they found nothing. Our congregation owns three photographs that were taken during the Galveston plan, and those are the ones you see everywhere, over and over again. We give them to anybody that wants to use them, because there are no other pictures. 
And unfortunately, when the society had its meeting in Galveston to try and um, bring the families together of the people that who came through the port, none of them came with any photographs. There weren't any. Somewhere there may be, and one day they may show up. All right, I've talked to you enough. Speak much longer here than I ever do on the pulpit. Um, I'm infamous for my brevity um, on Friday nights and Shabbos and even Yenifu. So, well, can I answer some questions for you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you say a word that puts the Galveston thing in the context, the overall context of Galveston at the point of entry? Because you know, well, to be honest with you, it wasn't apparent.